Wonderful. Thank you very much. So, uh, I'd like to uh, bring greetings from the world of analysis. This talk will have some analytic uh, content. I'm, I apologize to Dennis Olson for that. Um, actually, I've been traveling for the last several years in, in the world of uh, representation theory. So, this is really a talk about representation theory, which is a, a mixture of a number of things, analysis, and algebra, geometry, and so on. So that's, that's really where the talk is uh, coming from. So Wolfgang uh, introduced the baum kahn conjecture on Monday. And uh, I think he had it about right, but let me add a little bit to, to what <laughs> Wolfgang said about where it comes from. BC, Baum and uh, Kahn. So, uh, indeed, this business of uh, studying uh, semi direct products, this was a, a very big breakthrough in, in C star algebra's problem of studying the, the K theory of C star algebras of groups which look like this, or more generally twisted uh, tensor products of, of Z, of group algebra of Z, and some C star algebra. This was figured out by Pimsner and Wojcicki. Big breakthrough around about uh, 1980. I think the paper was from. You wrote that the Z, the tension of Z is on the right side. Z is on the right side, yes. Yeah, that was some mistake. Excuse me, but some people turned around. Uh huh. They write H. Z acts on H. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Okay. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> is everyone happy? Z is acting on H. One automorphism of one group, H. I could write a short exact sequence. I could. But since you already know that, you can write it in your own head, right? So. <laughs> at the same time, uh, Alan Kahn was uh, looking at uh, foliations and creating index theory for foliations and uh, so on. Geometry of transverse spaces of foliations. Around about the same time, there's a famous paper from uh, 1980. And there's one other piece of evidence uh, which Baum and Kahn used, and that's, that comes from representation theory, in particular the theory of the discrete series, which I'll, I'll mention in just a moment. This is uh, a monumental achievement of Harris Chandra, but in, uh, in around about the same time as these events here, Atir and Schmidt reworked the discrete series using index theory and the Dirac operator, the sorts of things that uh, we here in, uh, well, we in, K theory are, are comfortable with a little bit earlier, I think 1979 or something like that. 77, I have in my notes. So there was a lot going on uh, at the same time, and uh, Baum and Kahn had a wonderful idea to put it all together, but they would not have been able to do it if it wasn't for one uh, more thing, which is an amazing amount of uh, optimism about what could possibly be true. And uh, it really is uh, it's this that I want to, to focus on uh, first. So let me explain to you why this conjecture should, should not be true. Because it's worth, worth understanding what we're up against in this uh, area. So it's a very general conjecture, and it applies to geometric objects coming from a variety of different sources. But it's one conjecture. And uh, there are a number of uh, problems uh, that you might uh, worry about. First of all, uh, as I just said, the, the, it's generality on the one hand versus the very small amount of evidence that they actually had, sort of paucity of examples. Another thing that's wrong, which uh, Wolfgang was kind uh, not to mention, one issue that uh, really plagues us in, in this world is the punctoriality problem. You start off with, say, a discrete group. Let's just consider the discrete groups. Then uh, the left hand, the, and there's a left hand side and a right hand side, just like there is in Farrell Jones, as, as Wolfgang explained. And the left hand side is functorial, it's a functor of groups, and, and, and the right hand side is not. And this is uh, really a, an awkward and embarrassing circumstance. We're trying to show, show two things are equal, and one is a functor, and, and the other isn't a uh, functor at all. So it's uh, extremely unlikely that in, indeed these two things could possibly be equal. I mean, it might be a functor for some. Ab ab Absolutely incredible reason, but it's certainly not uh, obvious at all. Okay. 
And the final thing I want to mention has to do with uh, the discrete series and uh, representation theory. And this is what I want to discuss in a bit more detail today. When, when Baum and Kahn formulated their conjecture, it was not just about the discrete series. The theory of the discrete series, which is due to Harish Chandra, has a remarkable and beautiful and ultimately simple conclusion. These special representations are classified in more or less the same way that Hermann Weyl classified the representations of compact groups. At the end, when you look at the final result, it looks inevitable and beautiful and rigid and, and nothing could possibly be done to improve this wonderful theory of Harish Chandra. But there are other representations which are not discrete, discrete series and, and very subtle issues can be detected at the level of K theory. So if these subtle issues, which are not beautiful and inevitable, but much more delicate, if these subtle issues worked out in a different way than they did work out, then the baum kahn conjecture would be wrong. So this uh, representation, this uh, conjecture depends very heavily on the fine structure of representations. Harris Chandra dealt with the discrete series in, in the 1960s. It, was, it almost killed him, but, but he, he successfully dealt with it. Uh, but the fine structure which is needed to, to, to check the baum kahn conjecture, this wasn't sorted out until uh, the middle of the 1970s uh, by a, a large uh, collaboration of people. It's really a delicate uh, business. And yet, and yet uh, this fine, fine structure appears at the level of K-theory. So it's a bit of a miracle <laughs> that despite their, their ignorance of these things, uh, actually Paul's ignorance of these things, everything worked out so, so beautifully so far. So the conjecture is true in a number of cases, including the cases that I'm going to talk about involving what are called reductive groups. Uh, but it's a bit of a miracle that it is. And uh, so what I want to do is to try and explain um, how it is that, that despite the, the steep odds, we can uh, make some statements about, about uh, Lie groups. And I'd like to suggest that uh, there's something in this game for the L-theory people. There are quadratic forms all over the place, remission forms all over the place in representation theory. And uh, I believe that it's worth the while of uh, you guys, at least the technology people in the room, the L-theory people in the room, to pay uh, close attention to what the representation theorists are struggling with. So I'll talk about that uh, as time goes on. Okay. Now, In representation theory, maybe I should start by describing the, the types of groups that, that I want to uh, be talking about. These are called real reductive groups. And the actual definition of this class is a total pain in the neck. So let's just deal with a small uh, subclass, a, a rather large subclass, but uh, enough uh, to, for our purposes. So what do I mean by this? I mean a subgroup of, of GLNR uh, with two properties. Uh, the first property is that it should be closed under transpose operation. So for example, SLNR is good, upper triangular matrices bad. We'll see upper triangular matrices, but uh, in a different context. And, and the other thing is that these guys should be defined by polynomial equations. This is just a small technicality, but for the sake of uh, being precise at at least one point on the first couple of boards, let me put this in. So there's a bunch of polynomial equations, and, and G is a common zero set. The issue here just has to do with connected components. Any group with this property has a finite number of components, and any group which is connected, which has the first property, is contained as a component in one of these groups, which has this second property here. It's just a small issue of connectedness, which, uh, which we're discussing here. Anyway, these are the groups, and SLNR is the, the prototypical example. And in, in representation theory, there's an obsession with irreducible representations. The number one thing a representation theorist wants to do is find all of the irreducible representations. And there's a pretty widespread agreement about what an irreducible representation is. It's not a non-trivial matter to decide what you exactly mean by, a non -trivial, uh, by a re an irreducible representation. Irreducible representation on what, for example, what kind of space? Uh, I'll discuss that uh, in a moment. On the other hand, in the world of K-theory or, or L-theory, we're not so much interested in irreducibles as we are in uh, projective modules. 
And uh, when you talk about projective modules, you have to be a lot more uh, specific about where you're operating, what your category of representations is, not just what the irreducibles are. And now there are a bunch of uh, different options. And uh, this talk is mostly about comparing two uh, of the most prominent uh, options, what they have to do with one another. And, and to that end, let me build a couple of convolution algebras. I'll build a couple of convolution algebras, and then the, the, the relevant category will be the category of modules over these convolution algebras. And the first is called uh, S of G. It's some sort of Schwartz algebra, which I'll describe. In the world of representation theory, uh, this is often called the Castleman algebra, after the guy who studied it the most. And uh, here's what it is. Well, it's, it's uh, an adaptation of the usual idea of Schwartz class functions. So this means uh, that we're dealing with what are called rapid decay functions. Oopsie. And the condition of rapid decay uh, is this, that the function f should decay so rapidly to zero that even if I multiply it by a polynomial function, any polynomial function, the result is still bounded. So our groups are, are real algebraic varieties, and this is some intrinsic object that you can attach to any real algebraic variety. OK, any Nash space. So this is intrinsic. It comes from a very simple place, the place that you're, you're looking at, if you're looking at this part of the board over here. It comes from the group as a geometric space. It's just the algebra of functions on the group. They're not polynomials. They're, they're more like 1 over polynomials. They go to 0 at infinity better than uh, polynomial functions go to infinity at infinity. Okay. Oh, and the same for the derivatives of f. So. Yeah, the functions should have derivatives, which also behave well. Yeah, so this is some regular function. In other words, polynomial function on G. So it's the set of all of these Fs in this property. It's a completely natural thing, which you might want to study even if you didn't care about representations. It's just there. It, well, it's sort of so this part of the definition is uh, uh, symmetrical in, in PNF. I'm looking at functions on G with the property that if you multiply them by any polynomial, they still are bounded. In fact, is your, your arrow of the right the mm. yes, I think isn't that where it goes? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yes, P is a regular function. Right. It's a polynomial function. Yeah. No, p is a regular function. p is a regular function. f is, a, f is something like uh, you know, e to the minus x squared. f is something which is transcendental, and it goes to 0 faster. And then your polynomial goes to infinity. The polynomial function. The polynomial of the entries of the matrix. enjoy this German technology here. This is, uh, <laughs> this is one of the algebras uh, that I want to discuss today. And it's the, one that, uh, it's the one that Dennis might like. And now let me show you the one that Dennis will definitely not like. Dennis is my uh, exemplar today for someone who does not like analysis. I'm, I'm sorry, that, <laughs> that's your role. You're like <laughs> Like the, the villain in, in, the, in the room, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. <laughs> On the other hand, you're the sentimental hero, as far as the rest of the audience is concerned. <laughs> this algebra has very little, the one I've just described, has very little to do with the C star algebra. It's very remotely connected to the C star algebra of G, the algebra that uh, Wolfgang was mentioning. It sits inside of the C-star algebra, but it's so tiny compared to the C-star algebra that the properties of the C-star algebra are scarcely reflected at all in this thing, at least in any apparent way. 
On the other hand, here's another object. This isn't what the representation theorists, how they usually write it, but I'll call it the Harris-Chandra algebra. And it's de de defined in a, in, a, in a really horrible way. Again, it's functions, complex uh, functions on the group. Uh, but uh, here's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to take f, and instead of just multiplying it by the natural functions p, you do this uh, strange thing. You take the logarithm of any such p. p is still a polynomial function. And you look at all of this thing. Then you demand it to be an L2 of g. It is one ugly dog of a definition. Even the analysts don't like this thing. This is a, a truly hor and then same for derivatives to make it even worse. There's not a lot to recommend this algebra upon first acquaintance. You, know, you look at this thing and say, huh. one of the things you might say if you're alert is, well, is it even an algebra? And that's not obvious. Not at all obvious. Yeah, the, the multiplication here, let me emphasize, is convolution. We're talking about convolution rings of groups. So it's not obvious that this, this is even an algebra. You have to motor a certain way through representation theory before you can uh, conclude that, yeah, okay, you take two functions of this type. If you take two L2 functions and you convolve them, as you will remember from graduate school, the convolution of two L2 functions is a priori an L-infinity function. Uh, not again an L2 function, but in this particular case, the convolution of these slightly more than L2 functions, any two such slightly more than L2 functions, is again a slightly more than L2 function. Yeah, isn't that what the representation theory conclusion? Yeah. It, yeah. You, you need to understand. Uh, I, I won't go into it. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, you can suppress the analysis, and then you won't see. You, you, it doesn't have to be manifest that there is analysis, but then the idea which makes this thing into a representation theory, you just have to pluck from the sky. If you want to see why naturally this is an algebra, then it, it comes from analysis. And here's the reason. Morally speaking, this is an algebra you should define after the representation theory is done, because what this is, is the uh, algebra of Schwartz class functions not on the group. This is the algebra of Schwartz class functions on the group. It's the algebra of Schwartz class functions on the dual, on the space of irreducible representations, in, in fact, on a space of so-called tempered representations. This will become clearer as we go along. This algebra does have a beautiful uh, aspect to itself, but you cannot see it directly. You can see it under Fourier transform. If you have an abelian group, if you have a function on an abelian group, you get a function f hat on the dual group. That's called the Fourier transform. And something roughly similar is true in this non-commutative world. And, and what the Fourier transform is, uh, of this algebra is something that's recognizable and beautiful and simple. When you calculate this space of irreducible tempered representations, it turns out to be a bunch of vector spaces, pretty much. And so we have a traditional notion of Schwartz functions there. The dual, this, this tempered dual, is in its own right an affine algebraic variety, more or less. Uh, and so we have a natural notion of Schwartz class functions there. And that's what this thing is all about. But if you're a, a geometer, and to be honest, that's what I am these days mostly, this is a quite a, a difficult thing to wrap your mind around. Even if you're an analyst, it's a difficult thing to wrap your mind around. However, this thing is basically the same thing as the, as the object which uh, Wolfgang was talking about. This is an algebra. It does <coughs> uh, sit inside the reduced Easter algebra like the previous guy did. Uh, but this fellow here is practically the same thing as this fellow here. They have all of the same uh, properties. In particular, they have the same k-theory. This thing, this thing is closed under all of the good functional calculi, not, e not just the holomorphic calculus, but even the C-infinity calculus. So this, this is an excellent C-star algebra. The, the C-star algebra looks like continuous functions vanishing at infinity 
on this uh, tempered dual. Here we have Schwartz class functions vanishing at infinity. They're pretty much the same thing. Okay. All righty, what should I like to... And anyway, so the BAMCON conjecture is about uh, these two uh, algebras. And there's a sort of... First of all, maybe I should say... If you're studying modules, irreducible modules over this Schwartz algebra, the one that's up uh, here. So all of these algebras are, are uh, Frechet algebras, and I'm, I'm speaking here of representations on Frechet spaces. Uh, if you're keeping close track of the details, these are non-degenerate representations. And these things are basically... There's an interesting subtlety that I'll come back to uh, in a little while. Basically, the irreducible representations of uh, representation theory, of Harris, the ones that Harris Chandra studied, and especially the ones that Langland studied, etc. So the domain of representation theory is basically the space of irreducible modules over this algebra. Whereas the irreducible representations in the same sense of this Frechet algebra are the irreducible tempered representations, as you might expect, whatever tempered means. That was studied by Harris Chandra. These are all, well, both of them, fresh algebras, yeah. All right. And now let me say just a word about uh, projective modules and, and K-theory of these things. It's possible to formulate a baum kahn conjecture for both of these algebras. You could, you know... For insurance purposes, you could make either of these the left-hand side and make two conjectures because, you know, one of them has a better chance of being true than, than both of them, or than either of them individually. And it's interesting to see how that uh, works out. So let me just uh, summarize very rapidly what we understand about the K-theory of these guys. I should say we understand everything. We can calculate the K-theory of these things completely using all of everything we know and everything that the representation theorists know. So if you're, you're studying in the appropriate sense uh, projective modules over this uh, Schwartz algebra, these algebras don't have units, so you have to argue a little bit about what uh, the correct notion of projective module is. I won't do that. Easy is a bit of an exaggeration. This thing is accessible to the techniques that, or the topological versions of the techniques that you've been hearing about. Let me just say Carl Jones techniques. We understand how to uh, translate uh, Arthur's lectures into analysis, and uh, once we've done the translation, we can calculate the, what the K-theory of this thing is. And the answer is really incredibly beautiful and simple. Namely, you just take inside of G all of the orthogonal matrices, that's the maximal compact subgroup, and you look at its representation ring. There's one generator of this K-theory for each irreducible representation of the maximal compact subgroup. That's a slight lie, but that's essentially the truth. So it's wonderful. We have a beautiful uh, understanding of what this fellow is. On the other hand, it's pretty much inaccessible to interpretation. Once you've done the calculation, you could ask, well, what does it mean? What can you say about representation theory as a result of this? And the answer is uh, pretty, pretty much nothing uh, from rep through representation theory. And for the other guy, it's exactly the reverse. I'll just say the reverse. This is pretty much inaccessible. Not completely, but on, only with a supreme effort can you uh, access this through these Farrell Jones uh, techniques. On the other hand, this thing immediately tells you a great deal of interest about representation theory. 
And this is the, the paradox, this is the, the fundamental dramatic tension in this area. This ugly dog up here is uh, not so ugly if you're a representation theorist. You can read off all sorts of wonderful facts about representation theory from this guy. On the other hand, if you want to be able to feed into that some, some prior calculation using geometry of what the k-theory is, this turns out to be amazingly difficult. But S of g is exactly the reverse. Okay. So let me just uh, mention one thing. I mentioned, I, we discussed discrete series a little while ago. If you have a discrete series, you can build a function uh, in the following way. Each discrete series has what's called a formal dimension, roughly speaking, the dimension of the reference, representation space divided by the, the uh, volume of the group. That's infinity over infinity, but it resolves into a nice finite number. And here you can just put a matrix coefficient. And this thing here is an idempotent under convolution multiplication in the Harris-Chandra algebra. So each of the discrete series, each of these wonderful things that Harris Chandra classified according to a scheme laid out by Hermann Weyl and that uh, Atir and Schmidt understood in terms of index theory, gives an actual idempotent in this thing. These are the representations which are simultaneously irreducible and projective. That's what makes them special. And Harris Chandra built the entirety of representation theory, tempered representation theory, in terms of these things. And there they are. They're actual idempotents. They're obviously projective modules, and they sit right in here. So you can just pick them out. They, they form each one a distinct generator of this k-theory group. On the other hand, this function, where is it here? Although it goes to zero at infinity, it doesn't go to zero fast enough to be in this uh, Schwartz algebra, the one up here. So there's the, the fundamental tension. I've set up the, the dramatic elements, and, and now let's uh, attempt to resolve this. Any questions? Before we Yeah, a projective module is typically uh, something like a continuous family of irreducible uh, representations. Can you say that the group level representation theory is discrete? Yes. Okay. That's the miracle that Harris Chandra discovered. These, these are what Harris Chandra would call cuspidal representations. He has a general philosophy that all of representation theory is assembled from cuspidal representations according to a geometric process called parabolic induction. And uh, these fundamental building blocks are right there in the K theory, right to begin with, in the K theory of this guy. Not this guy, unfortunately. But you have also sort of connected yeah. to the about the Hitler algebra and the uh, Hitler algebra comes from a full limit over the complex of the subgroups and so on. Yeah. The representation is pretty discrete here. Yeah, the story for piadic groups is a, is a little bit different because it's very relevant to understand cuspidal representations, what are called supercuspidal representations. There are algebraic representations which play the role of these guys, which are not part of analysis, they're part of algebra. They sit inside the algebraic Hecke algebra. Nonetheless, there's a story to be told in piadic groups, which is similar to the one I'm trying to tell now. Uh, can you ask me that at the end? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to tell you about parabolic induction because it's here that there's an awful lot of dynamics and geometry which makes me think of Farrell-Jones in a direct way. But uh, I'm in a race against time here. And uh, so I'll, I'll come back to that. I'd love to discuss that, but let, let's do it at the end. Okay. So there are these special representations, these so-called tempered representations, and the theory of the discrete series is part of the theory of tempered representations. And then there is a larger realm of representations which are not tempered, which are not even unitary representations, and that's important too. And that's the theory which has a lot to do with S of G, as I've described it here. And I, I'd like to tell you, because it's uh, amazingly simple to do so, I'd like to tell you a wonderful result of Langlands which connects those two categories, those two classes of irreducible representations. The tempered guys, which are all about this fellow on the one hand, and the so-called irreducible admissible guys, which are all about uh, S of G on the other hand. And so the punchline is, the first punchline is going to be that the result of Langlands that I'm about to tell you about should be interpreted as, uh, as the bam con conjecture for this Harris-Chandra algebra, for the, the reduced c star algebra. 
if you want to understand the Baumkorn conjecture for, for, the, for S of G, well, that's, that's a matter of geometry. That's the conjecture. There is a conjecture, and it is true, and it's true for reasons like the reasons that uh, Arthur was describing to us. But for S of G, for H C of G, for the Harris Chandra algebra, it, it's a different story. So, let's not get too ambitious here. Let's uh, to avoid all of the Lie theory jargon. Let's just talk about uh, SLNR. So what the theorem of Langlands uh, does, the particular theorem I'm going to mention, is that it classifies exactly the irreducible representations in the sense of interest to representation theorists, which I'll be more specific about uh, in a little while. It classifies those irreducible representations which are not tempered, that those irreducible representations which do not have some desirable property. It seems kind of bizarre that this could possibly be um, a, a doable task. But what the miracle of, that Langlands observed is that this problem is much easier than classifying the tempered representations. The ones which fail to have a good property are easier to classify than the ones which have it. Of course, there's a catch, and, and the catch is that uh, Langlands classifies the irreducible representations in terms of tempered representations of other groups, as you'll see. Okay. And he does so in terms of what are called Langlands data or Langlands parameters. So a Langlands parameter is a, is a triple of things. It's an L and a phi and a pi. So this is a, just a block diagonal subgroup, so-called Levy subgroup. Subgroup. Of SLN. So maybe, it's, uh, maybe N is 5 and it's the 2 by 2 block and, and then the 3 by 3 block just below it, something like that. And if you have such a block diagonal uh, subgroup, you can uh, factor it into, into two pieces in a canonical way. It looks a little ad hoc if I just describe it for SLN, but there's a canonical way of doing it. So this guy here, M, has the property that its blocks have determinant plus or minus 1. And this guy here has the property that its blocks are positive multiples of the identity. And every block diagonal matrix can be canonically factored, uniquely factored uh, in such a way. That's what uh, L is. Pi is pretty easy. It's one of these irreducible tempered representations of the group M. Of these, uh, if a matrix has a determinant plus or minus 1, basically it's a little SLNR matrix. I mean, plus or minus 1 doesn't make much difference between saying determinant is 1 and saying the determinant is plus 1 or minus 1. So that's what uh, phi is. And uh, so what pi is, excuse me. Pi is what's called a dominant. I'll explain what it means. Character of this abelian group. It's a homomorphism from this abelian group into the non-zero complex numbers. Not a unitary character, just a homomorphism. So here's a, a typical element of A. It's a diagonal matrix, and the blocks are multiples of the identity like this, and the A's are, are positive numbers. And uh, here's what you can do. This is the only thing you can do to build homomorphisms into the complex numbers. You can just raise the various A's to various uh, complex powers like this. And dominant just is something that you may remember from Lie theory. It just means that the here it means that the real parts of these complex numbers are in decreasing order like that. So the theorem is that these exactly parameterize the non-tempered representations. The non-tempered, irreducible, admissible, whatever that means, representations of G. It's dead easy. I, I just told you uh, exactly what the parameterization is. If I wanted to tell you how to parameterize the irreducible tempered representations, well, that would take more work. But uh, this he thing here is, is really very beautiful and simple. 
if you have such a collection of datum, data, the first thing you can do is you could tensor, multiply phi and pi together. That would give you a representation of L. And then here again is this mysterious parabolic induction. And it produces a representation of uh, G in some way, which I won't tell you about right now. P stands for the group of upper triangular matrices, but you could also use the lower triangular matrices. It's usually called P bar as your vehicle for understanding parabolic induction. And then you'd get another representation. And usually they're the same. There's a canonical intertwiner like this, which is uh, usually an isomorphism, but not all the time. And just for completeness, here's the full story. The Langlands quotient associated to the data is exactly this irreducible represent this representation here, which is not necessarily irreducible divided by the kernel of J. Or if you like, it's the image of J in here. That's called the Lagland sub-representation. These are all of the irreducible representations of G. Unitary or not, finite dimensional or not, da 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 da, -da or not, all of them. As long as they're not tempered. And it's a complete story. And what I want you to extract from this is the following observation. So now let's go back to a world that's maybe a little more comfortable if you're, maybe if you're not, a, not if you're a geometer, but if you're a technology sort of person, one of these people who studies a particular letter of the alphabet, K or L, something like that. the other K. This space of uh, Langlands parameters, which is the non-tempered dual, so to speak, first of all, it's a decent uh, space. It carries a natural uh, topology, and it's uh, contractible. It's locally compact and contractible. in the sense of locally compact spaces. It's one point compactification is pointedly uh, homotopy equivalent to a point. And it's the difference between S of G and the Harris-Chandra algebra of G, at least in, as far as representation theory is concerned. The Harris-Chandra algebra, if you, if you think of its spectrum, its space of irreducible representations as being the so-called tempered dual, the only way that that differs from the dual of S of G is this space of Langlands here, and it's contractible. So, naturally follows that, you hope, that uh, this is true. So this is the algebra, the k-theory of the algebra of extremely rapidly decaying functions. And here's the algebra of not so rapidly decaying functions, which is bigger, more accessible in some ways to represent uh, interpretation, at least if you take the k-theory. And uh, the Langlands isomorphism, the Langlands classification is strongly suggestive of the fact that this map here should be an isomorphism, which it is, because we happen to know the Baumkorn conjecture, and so we can separately calculate these two sides. We know that these two sides have the same K theory, thanks to, I don't know, Farrell and Jones, if you like, some elementary techniques over here, thanks to the work of either the representation theorists who did the big calculation or Vincent Lafourg over here. Okay? So you can check both sides, they're both equal to a third geometric thing, and therefore they're equal to one another. And so this Langlands isomorphism is a true isomorphism. But wouldn't it be nice if you could prove it directly using this result of Langlands, which is not a difficult result in the grand scheme of things. This is in chapter three of the big books on representation theory, right? They have 15 chapters, but in chapter three, the, the Langlands classification is done. This is a relatively, surprisingly, relatively basic fact about representation. So my contention is that, that what, uh, the, the reason the Baumkorn conjecture is true for something like a real reductive group is, is the reason, uh, this reason here, that Langlands explains the difference between this algebra and its k-theory and this algebra and its k-theory. And the, the difference is exactly some, in some meaning of the word difference that I'll attempt to clarify, the difference is exactly this space of Langlands parameters, which is contractible. So topological k-theory will not see it. So, 
Yeah, when I say uh, Farrell Jones, I, I, I said it to keep you guys happy. Uh, <laughs> you apply the Dirac, dual Dirac method, you apply our, you know, our cognate of that. It's, it, in my uh, opinion, what we do and what you do within the context of this algebra here is exactly the same. I should say, by the way, that no one, this is something I've been discussing with Wolfgang, no one's actually written down how to deal directly with these Frochet algebras. We don't actually have that technology in a box, in a paper on the archive. Uh, but everyone knows, you know, it's common, common under, commonly understood that this thing can be uh, calculated by those means. All right. So I should like to um, tell you uh, how it is that uh, we might possibly go from there to here, right? And uh, it's not, not obvious at all. I'd like to, yeah, maybe draw a picture. I don't, I don't think there's been a picture yet. Dennis can wake up because there's going to be a picture. Let me show you what the representations of SL2 are look like. And uh, I'm just going to show you half of them, what you might call the genuine representations. In other words, they're not representations. They don't factor through the projective special linear group. SL2R has a two-element center, and there are some representations which are trivial on the center, and so they're really representations of this quotient group. I won't, for simplicity, I won't show you those. I'll just show you the 50% of the representations uh, which uh, do not factor through SL2R. Ah, I will come back to this. I, I forgot, I have to tell you one more thing before I can do this. So let me, let me pause for a moment. Uh, there will be a picture. We'll come back to that in just a minute. Sorry about that. I was getting just a little bit ahead of myself. Before I can show you a picture and before I can attempt to add some, hopefully add some substance to this line which says so and then question mark, I need to tell you about one of the, the secret weapons that the representation theorists use to, to make sense of representation theory, to begin to analyze representations. It's not a, it's not a complicated thing, but it's, it's not something that has any counterpart in, in the world of uh, representation theory of discrete groups. It's a, so it's a little bit of a surprising discovery of Harris Chandra that this is a good thing to do. And it involves a, a commutative ring, Z. And what Z is, is the center of the enveloping algebra of the Lie algebra of G. We haven't discussed Lie theory, but of course it exists, and so there's a Lie algebra. Uh, there's an associative algebra generated by this Lie algebra, and it has a center, and the center is substantial. This is a relatively large polynomial algebra. It's an algebra on a relatively large number of generators. For example, for SLN, there are n minus 1 uh, generators. Now I, can, now I can go back and tell you what the good representations are for representation theory, the ones that Langlands was classifying. They involve a, a one idea which I haven't told you yet. It's this thing here. People say that the representation, a representation is quasi-simple. If the center of the enveloping algebra acts through a character, through a one-dimensional homomorphism, a homomorphism to C. If I have an irreducible representation of G, that is to say an irreducible representation of this convolution algebra S of G, it's also a representation of the Lie algebra, and so it's also a representation of the enveloping algebra, and so by restriction it's also a representation of this thing Z. And this thing Z is a commutative algebra, and one way you could uh, obtain a representation of z is just by evaluating uh, this polynomial algebra at a point, setting the variables equal to some complex numbers. 
It turns out that that's not automatic. There is no Schur's lemma which says that that happens necessarily for an irreducible representation. But when it does, you say the representation is quasi-simple. And then the good representations are, for representation theory, the ones which uh, Langlands is classifying, are those which are irreducible representations of S of G with the additional property that they're quasi-simple. And this is, uh, represents a great deal of progress in the classification problem. Each representation now, to each representation, is attached a bunch of complex numbers, the so-called infinitesimal character, the, the representation of this polynomial algebra uh, Z. There are representations uh, which don't have this property, so there is no good Schur's lemma, which guarantees quasi-simplicity in general. Now I can draw a picture uh, a little better. Here's a picture of the, the complex plane. Maybe I should say this character is, is called the infinitesimal character of phi. And let me draw representations, arrange them on the plane according to their infinitesimal characters. In fact, the way things work, the infinitesimal character will be z squared. Much better to draw the pictures like that. And here's what it is. It's very, very simple. Uh, these are the genuine representations that I was mentioning. Do we have a little bit of color chalk here? Basically, there's one representation for each z squared. Except for some exceptions, 0 gets two representations. I'm going to color them like this. I'm also going to color the y-axis in this uh, beautiful orange color as well. And then something interesting happens at the number 2. There, there are three representations with that infinitesimal character. And there are three representations at 4 and so on. And it's symmetrical when z goes to minus z. So the same thing is happening here. And the two of these, two of these representations deserve to be colored orange. And the other one deserves to be colored white. If your eyesight is anywhere near as bad as mine, it might be hard to figure out what's going on there. But there are three dots at each even integer, except for zero. And uh, zero, there are two dots. And everywhere, two of the dots are orange, and one of them is white, except for zero, where there is no white dot. Anyway, the, the, the representations that I've colored in this beautiful orange rep constitute the tempered dual. And the, and the ones which are white, including the rest of the board here, this is the admissible dual, the rest of the dual. Most of the time, there's a unique representation with a given infinitesimal character, but not always. Sometimes there are some extra ones. And it's an interesting exercise to reconcile this picture with what I said about the Langlands classification. Ah, let me say one more thing before I move that out of the way. Yes. So there. Mm -hmm. Let me, so the, in this particular case, the, uh, the center of the enveloping algebra, this commuting algebra which always exists for any reductive group, is a polynomial algebra in one variable. Right. So, uh, and what it is, is you just evaluate at the given point in the plane. And I can tell you a little bit more about what these algebras uh, S and HC are now. Namely, S of G is the, the holomorphic functions. Roughly speaking, the holomorphic operator-valued functions looks like the algebra of holomorphic operator-valued functions on this plane with values in the representations attached to the various points in the plane. Whereas the Harris-Chandra algebra functions on the entire plane. You might ask, what are these operators? And the answer is that attached to each plane is a Hilbert space. 
which is the representation attached to that point, and, and the, the relevant operators are operators, compact operators, it as it happens, on that Hilbert space. These Hilbert spaces vary in a natural way. In fact, they're all exactly the same. Okay. Something special happens at these points, but let's not go into it. And this thing here is the, the real Schwartz functions on the, on the tempered dual. As promised, the, the, the tempered dual consists of uh, a vector space, a one-dimensional vector space, actually a one-dimensional vector space divided by two, uh, and then a bunch of points, which are zero-dimensional vector spaces. So we can talk about Schwarz class functions. And that's what these two things are. Okay. So they're quite different. They're quite different in character. I mentioned at the very beginning that uh, Baum and Kahn were very optimistic. And uh, they were optimistic because they did not really take much into account about this representation theory, except for the discrete series. Now, in the particular low-dimensional case of SL2, the discrete series is most of what is interesting in this picture, but not everything. There's also the fact that at, at zero, z equals zero, there are two tempered representations with infinitesimal character zero, not one. If, by accident, in an alternative universe, as predicted by string theory, those two representations were to coalesce into one irreducible representation, that would be it. The game would be up. The Baumkorn conjecture would be false. So the fact that this re representation decomposes into, that th there are two irreducible representations here, let me put it that way, uh, this is detected by, uh, by the Baumkorn theory. And this is a very subtle issue. This is not an issue that was resolved by Harish Chandra, for example. It's much more delicate to understand these fine structure of representations. This is called the theory of the R group due to Knapp and uh, Zuckin. <laughs> I come from Penn State, where we do loop quantum gravity, so no, I'm obliged to uh, not believe in string theory. All right, so I'm running out of time, so let me try and get to a, to a reasonable punchline here. So I, I wanted to, to put, uh, I wanted to put this. Yeah, yeah. I'm Uh, I, you know, that's extremely dangerous. I can talk forever. So. Maybe not now. Oh, OK. <laughs> so I'll, re I'll reach a conclusion, and then we can decide whether you, you know, just how gluttonous you are for punishment. Okay. Say again? Okay. <laughs> okay. So when you're studying the baum kahn conjecture, let me just recapitulate as I'm doing this, doing the housekeeping. You're, whether you like it or not, if you're doing it in the strict sense of Seastar algebras, or if you like Harris Chandra algebras, what you're doing is you're paying close attention to the fine structure of representation theory, the hard stuff. Some of this issue of R groups uh, is not understood in any other better way than a case-by-case -case analysis. You know, in, in Lie theory, there are types A, B, C, D, E, F, G, an infinite number of cases. And you just go through them, you know, A, A N, B, N, C, N, D, N, F, 4, B, G, G, 2, etc. You do all of them one case at a time. It's incredibly uh, delicate, OK? But it's, at the same time, we have this assurance that the Baumkorn conjecture is true, and so topology is somehow governing. Topology is somehow guaranteeing that this representation here, uh, there are two representations with infinitesimal character zero, which lie in the tempered dual. It's quite impressive. When I was doing piadic groups, uh, we had a game. One of the reasons I'm, I'm trying to tell you all of this is that I think you'll enjoy this game for a while. Uh, we can predict these things on the basis of K-theory. And so in piadic groups, we found some friends. We made some friends in piadic groups, and we would tell them. This representation is going to decompose into three irreducible pieces. This one is going to decompose into three pieces, but two of them are going to be isomorphic to him. And sure enough, they go away and calculate. And they were amazed. We were right. It's like they found a, you know, a talking chimpanzee. This, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it, it went on for a while. But of course, they got tired of us after a while. They, they just said, go away. You know, the novelty wore off. And uh, so then I decided I needed to learn the representation theory properly. But it's something, something is clearly going on. That's the point I'm trying to make. Something is clearly going on connecting geometry, relatively simple geometry, to some rather intricate issues in Lie theory. Okay, good. 
No, but to, to move on from that, uh, let me introduce, I think I'm ready to do this uh, one final object here in the story. Yeah, let me do this right now. So this is, this is an object that I'm currently quite uh, fascinated by. Uh, I should say at this point uh, that this part, everything I've told you right now is sort of the history of the subject, but this, this is a, an object that Jonathan Block and I have been thinking about for other reasons. I want to take the convolution algebra in the sense of Castleman, of this, in the geometric sense of Schwartz functions on this algebraic variety, convolution algebra of G. This is easy to understand. It's, uh, it's geometry. Okay, not exactly your type of geometry, but it, it's built out of the geometry of G as an algebraic variety. Here's the center of the enveloping algebra. That's relatively easy to understand. I mean, we're doing Lie theory, so come on. You have to have the, the Lie algebra in there somewhere. Here it is. And now I want to do the following thing. I want to take the function. So I said that uh, Z was a polynomial algebra. That is to say it's an algebra of regular functions on an affine algebraic variety, in fact, on an affine space. It's just an algebra of polynomial functions on a space. Okay, that space has a funny name in representation theory. It's uh, H check mod W. It just means the, the space I was drawing up here. That's what it is. It's that space divided by Z equals minus Z. But I want to take the smooth functions, not the regular functions. It's a compromise between complex analysis on the one hand and C-infinity analysis on the other hand. These are polynomial functions, so they certainly act by multiplication on smooth functions. On the other hand, they act so by as in the usual way, distributions act by convolution on regular functions. So you can form this guy here. Okay? So what this is in terms of our picture, this is the smooth operator valued function. on the full admissible dual. <coughs> and I forgot to say it, but they, they, these functions decay like Schwartz functions in the, in, the, in the vertical direction. They do that both for S of G and, and C of G. So there's some control I would like to put on these functions, which I'll suppress. It's halfway between a holomorphic object and, or being an admissible object, an, an object pertaining to the theory of Langlands and an object pertaining to the theory of Harish Chandra, because it's C-infinity functions, not holomorphic functions. Okay. And now let me, let me uh, sneak in uh, a theorem here, and, and then I'll stop, um, which is uh, a phenomenon which I used to be very uh, afraid of. It's a the, the phenomenon of Oka. Maybe here I should say that. Uh, phenomenon of Ocker and Grauer, hence of full. What the Ocker principle says is that if you have a complex manifold, which is a closed submanifold of Cn, and you study uh, smooth vector bundles on this complex manifold, then each smooth vector bundle carries a holomorphic structure. And moreover, thanks to this uh, uniqueness as a relative form of existence principle, carries a unique Smooth, smooth structure. So the holomorphic vector bundles are exactly the same thing as the C-infinity vector bundles on a reasonable space, on an affine algebraic variety or a submanifold of Cn, like this one here. Okay. I used to be very afraid of this because it's all about solving the D-bar problem. It seems very, very much, uh, very analytic, even for me. It seems very analytic. But then I was teaching um, an algebraic topology course in the Introduction to Singular Homology. And I was learning this at the same time, and I was amazed to learn it's, it's the same proof. It's, it's the same proof as what you use to prove the jordan kerf theorem using singular homology. So it's really some fundamental fact about the structure, the fabric of complex manifolds. This is not a difficult and um, erudite thing. It's just some basic feature of the way that complex spaces are built up. I'm trying to emphasize that point. Anyway, what it says here is that the inclusion Suppose instead of instead of tensoring with the C infinity function, suppose I just tensored with the holomorphic functions. Well, this isn't really doing anything at all. 
because these are already holomorphic functions. And if I tensor holomorphic functions with holomorphic functions, I just get the holomorphic functions. It's a fact that this thing is basically, not exactly, but basically the same thing as S of G itself. Whereas this thing is wildly different. Ah, smooth. But they have the same projective modules, is or induces an isomorphism on K theory. Now we're getting somewhere. Now we're, we have something intermediate. We're trying to show that uh, basically this fellow here, which is basically S of G, is the same thing as the Harris-Chandra algebra at the level of K-theory. This is what the bam Khan is all about. If we could prove this, we could on the one hand apply Farrell-Jones to S of G. On the other hand, read out representation theory from the Harris-Chandra algebra. And this thing sits right in the middle. Sorry, this thing here. Okay. But now what does it look like? It looks like C infinity functions on our space up here, whereas the Harris-Chandra algebra is C infinity functions on the, on the orange part of the space. So there's an obvious surjection from this crazy algebra here. It may be crazy, but it's easy to define. Right? You only need a bit of Lie theory and a bit of geometry in the sense of algebraic varieties to understand what this thing is. It's a, it's a doddle to understand this compared to the Harris-Chandra algebra, even to define it. Okay. And it's very closely related to the Harris-Chandra algebra, just because by restriction, it subjects onto the Harris-Chandra algebra. So this thing here maps to the Harris-Chandra algebra, and the kernel is exactly functions on the space of Langland's parameters, functions on this contractible space. So now we're getting somewhere. Now it really looks like this kernel should have zero k-theory just by the homotopy invariance of k-theory. If I was giving this talk a couple of months later, I would like to announce to you that all of these details are exactly in place, but they're not. But uh, uh, this, um, this seems to me the reason why, why the Bamcon conjecture is true. The Langlands is in the background. There is some fundamental fact about complex geometry which comes to in, into play, and, al and it allows you to separate the Langlands part of S of G from the orange Harris-Chandra part, and now you can apply the Langlands argument to show that the non-orange part of this picture doesn't contribute and therefore the k-theory of ooh, this guy here is the same thing as the, as the k-theory of S of G, as, as the, as the k-theory of uh, HC of G, excuse me. All right, it's quite intricate, uh, and this is one of the reasons I'm deeply skeptical that you could do anything like this for any class of groups much beyond the ones I've been talking about. For example, may a, lattice in, a lattice in SL, NR, okay, maybe, maybe you could make this method work by some Herculean effort. If you have some group that you just pluck out of the air, a mapping class group or something, there's really zero evidence, zero evidence that the Baumkorn conjecture is, is going to be true or even likely to be true for such a group, sadly. Okay, I'll stop, thank you. So, well, I mean, it, 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 everything I've said is, is certainly true uh, retrospectively, yeah. because we, we know a priori that the, the Baumkorn conjecture is true, but we're trying to understand why it's true, and so we're not allowed to understand. Yeah, so everything I've written down is true, but the question is to find a proof which is relatively simple and which will lead into representation theory, not come out of representation theory. And there, everything, everything's still a little bit up in the air at this time. And um, so I'd, there's nothing wrong with the Oka principle, but to understand how to organize the Langlands argument, which as I say is a relatively elementary argument, to understand how to organize it so as to show that the K theory of this ideal, the ideal of restriction from the whole picture to the orange, to understand how that Langlands argument allows you to say that the K theory of the ideal is zero, this, this I, I don't have a good grasp of. I, I know it's true just by inspection, if you like, but I don't know how to prove it um, in chapter three along with the ordinary Langlands. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of tired of, um, I'm not interested anymore in proving new cases of the BAMCON because I'm tired, you know, we did that, I did that. I want to understand why it is that what I did prove really is true. I mean, of course, I know the, I know the proofs, but I'm trying to understand the conceptual reason behind it. 
So I hope that if, if I really do understand the conceptual reason, I'll understand you know, really where we should stop in Baum Conland. And I believe that where we should stop is pretty much where we are, that uh, beyond what we know lies a, a, a territory where we really have no guidance whatsoever. Well, the, the, the best I can say is that there is no evidence whatsoever for the conjecture to be true in any realm beyond the realm of Lie groups. Um, yeah, and the realm of Lie groups may, may possibly in include discrete subgroups of Lie groups, depending on how optimistic you are. But if, if you pick a group, uh, even a mapping class group, which is not that far away from, from, from Lie theory, I, you know, this stuff here is, there's a lot going on. There's a lot in the center of the enveloping algebra, blah, blah, blah. There's a maximal compact subgroup I barely mentioned. There's a lot going on, and how it's going to work out for anything beyond a Lie group, I couldn't say. Well, our experience is that there's, there's not a great deal of difference between a discrete subgroup and a lattice in this part of the farrell jones baumkorn world. Co-compactness or co-finite volume doesn't tend to play much of a role. Hyperbolic groups, everything is fine. They're right on the edge of Martin's picture, so you know they're, they're barely there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it, it's another thing I learned getting old is that you cannot be categorical about anything, right? Uh, as soon as you make some definitive statement, this is the way it's, it is, then 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 it isn't. So. All right. Well, I, I think, uh, you know, with all uh, <laughs> due respect to Jean Bonnard Bost, I, I think that the L1 can, uh, algebra is a bit of a red herring. You should think about S of G, and you should think about something as small as S of G on the one hand, and something as big as this Harris Chandra algebra on the other hand. But yeah, I have no, nothing to say, nothing negative to say about the, 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 the version of the Baumkorn conjecture which involves this thing. I believe that this thing will be true. In, in enormous uh, generality. We talked about, uh, Arthur talked about a little bit about exact groups. I don't see any reason why the conjecture should be false for exact groups for this, this version of the, of the guy. And this guy, is, the conjecture is functorial and so on. There's nothing, to, nothing bad to say about this for a reasonable group, an exact group. If it's some horrid Gromov monster, that's a, you know, a different matter. I think it's, you should not think of L1 as being close to anything from a... That's true. Yeah. No, no, wait, 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 that's not true. Uh, this uh, L1 sits between S of G and the harris chandra algebra. And, yeah, if you want to philosophize from, from representation theory, L1 is all about isometric Banach space representations. And you know, talk about an ugly dog. Uh, the, the world of isometric Banach space representations is just horrid. So I would not expect, uh, except in miraculous situations like the one I'm trying to describe, it, be, it to be possible to say uh, a lot about L1. I'm, I'm skeptical about L1 you know, in, in, in large generality in the world of, say, exact groups. But I'm optimistic about S of G. No. That's probably true. Yeah, yeah. think about that. But, uh, yeah, <coughs> yeah. If, if you want the, the the best possible algebra where you have even a tiny, in my opinion, a tiny chance of things going right, it would be L1. Still, I'm kind of skeptical. <coughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That everything you say is true. Yeah. Yeah. So, like I say, it's I, I cannot be. Categorical. I cannot say here we should stop uh, with, with Lie groups. But on the other hand, it gets forbiddingly difficult after this point. <laughs>